Hello, hypertension resistors. So today I have an update on the Omicron variant, and I have several clips from several experts to give us what we need to know as of December 2nd, 2021. So let's get to it. First, I have Dr. Anthony Fauci. He is the director of the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases and the chief medical advisor to the president of the United States. He will tell us about the first case of the Omicron variant here in the United States and what we need to know about this person and what we need to do to protect ourselves. And also he'll tell us when we will know more about this very after Dr. Fauci, I will have Dr. John Campbell. He is a health educator, and Dr. John Campbell will tell us his opinion about the latest vitamin D research paper, if it's credible or not. And he will tell us what's going on in the world with this Omicron virus and about the vaccines. When can we expect a tweak? in the vaccines to directly be effective toward this new virus. And he will also give us an optimistic view on the Omicron virus. Next, I have a clip from Dr. Mobin Sayed. He will help us keep everything in perspective about this new variant. And lastly, I know many people are concerned about not having any antibodies once they're fully vaccinated. And a lot of people I've read on several posts uh, were concerned about this. In other words, once you're fully vaccinated, it's not really recommended to go and get tested to see if you have the antibodies that will protect you against the COVID-19 virus. But some people are getting this testing and some people are turning up with good titers, or in other words, their antibody levels are adequate, and others have no antibodies after being fully vaccinated, and they're getting really concerned about not having antibodies once they're fully vaccinated, and they feel that they're not protected. And even some people are expressing doubt about the vaccine because they don't have these antibodies. So I have Dr. Kiki Fairfax with the University of Utah who will tell us why not to worry. Dr. Fairfax spoke with Vincent Ricalio at Micro TV. And essentially she is just telling you that those antibodies are really not necessary. And she will be referring to childhood vaccines, but it's the same for COVID vaccination. <laughs> I know that's a lot, but I think it's going to be useful information of all that you need to know right now. So <laughs> here we go. Let's start with Dr. Fauci. You may have heard the, the California and San Francisco Departments of Public Health and the CDC have confirmed that a recent case of COVID-19 among an individual in California was caused by the Omicron variant. Genomic sequencing was conducted at the University of California at San Francisco, and the sequence was confirmed at the CDC as being consistent with the Omicron variant. So I know there are a lot of questions, but here's what we know right now. The individual was a traveler who returned from South Africa on November the 22nd and tested positive on November the 29th. The individual is self-quarantining, and all close contacts have been contacted, and all close contacts thus far have tested negative. The individual was fully vaccinated and experienced mild symptoms, which are improving at this point. So this is the first confirmed case of COVID-19 caused by the Omicron variant detected in the United States. And as all of you know, because we've been discussing this, this, we knew that it was just a matter of time before the first case of Omicron would be detected in the United States. And as you know, we know, I've been saying it, and my colleagues on the medical team and others have been saying it, we know what we need to do to protect people, get vaccinated. If you're not already vaccinated, get boosted. If you've been vaccinated for more than six months with an mRNA or two months with J&J, &J, and all the other things we've been talking about, about getting your children vaccinated, masking in indoor congregate settings, et cetera. If you look at the things that we have been recommending 
they're just the same. And we want to keep doing that and make sure we pay close attention to that. This is what we call in medicine an N equals one, which means that you really can't take anything away from a single patient. It is very, it's, it's, we feel good that this patient not only had mild symptoms, but actually the symptoms appear to be improving. But as we've said, there's a lot of information that is now evolving out of countries like South Africa that have a much larger number of individuals, not only who are confirmed, but individuals who are probables, which means they are going to have a lot of experience which we will benefit from here as the weeks go by. Some of you heard me say that in a matter of two weeks or two and a half, three weeks, we'll know a lot about transmissibility, about whether or not it uh, essentially eludes some of the protection from things like monoclonal antibodies, whether or not the disease itself in general is going to be severe, and what is the difference in an individual who's been vaccinated versus unvaccinated, boosted versus not boosted. We're going to get that information. I think, I think, I know <laughs> that we don't have enough information right now. As you know, and we've said this, that the profile of the molecular profile of the kinds of mutations that you see would suggest, A, that it might be more transmissible and that it might elude some of the protection of vaccines. But we don't know that now. We don't know what the, what the, what the constellation of mutations are actually going to be. We have to be prepared that there's going to be a diminution in protection, which is the reason why I keep getting back over and over again and say why it's so important to get boosted. But I think any declaration of what will or will not happen with this variant, it is too early to say. We have 60 million people in this country who are not vaccinated, who are eligible to be vaccinated. Let's get them vaccinated. Let's get the people who are vaccinated boosted. Let's get the children vaccinated. That's where we want to go. As a I think what's happening now is another example of why it's important for people to get vaccinated who've not been vaccinated, but also boosting. Boosting is really very important because the data that we get on boosting, if you look at the level, for example, of an antibody, a neutralizing antibody, peak following the second dose of a two-dose mRNA, it's like at this level. If you look at the peak following the third shot boost, it goes way up here. And people ask, why is that important? Because our experience with variants, such as the Delta variant, is that even though the vaccine isn't specifically targeted to the Delta variant, when you get a high enough level of an immune response, you get spillover protection, even against a variant that the vaccine wasn't specifically directed at. And that's the reason why we feel, even though we don't have a lot of data on it, there's every reason to believe that that kind of increase that you get with the boost would be helpful, at least in preventing severe disease of a variant like Omicron. So right now, I would not be waiting. People say, well, if we're going to have a, va a, a booster-specific vaccine, should we wait? If you are eligible, namely six months with a double uh, mRNA dose or two months with the J&J, &J, get boosted now. We may not need a variant-specific boost. We're preparing for the possibility that we need a variant-specific boost. And that's what the companies are doing. We have been, the administration has been in contact with the pharmaceutical companies to go ahead and take the steps in case we need it. But the mistake people would make is to say, let me wait and see if we get one. If you're eligible for boosting, get boosted right now. That uh, higher levels of vitamin D in the blood could be protective against severe illness and uh, death. And uh, some pretty convincing data, really. Now, but let's look at what's going on. So in the world, 226 cases actually confirmed of this uh, Omicron variant. That's what we know for sure. The real number, of course, is going to be way higher. Now, Moderna, the vaccine producers, they're, they're saying there's going to be a material drop off in the level of efficacy of their vaccine. They don't say how much. But basically they say it's not going to be as effective against Omicron as it was against Delta, for example. Pfizer, meantime, has applied to the FDA to boost 16 and 17 year olds, but there's no time scale for that yet. But that's sort of, this is, seems to be the way the vaccine manufacturers want to go, which of course is open to quite a bit of debate. Now, Pfizer's chief scientist 
So he's saying there's enough experimental vaccine to begin a, a clinical trial within about two months. And a very high commercial scale of vaccine production isn't going to be possible until early March next year. And it looks like Pfizer's probably a bit ahead of the game compared to the other vaccine manufacturers on that. So it's not anything like as quick as we would thought. In other words, what this means is that the Omicron variant is going to go around the world before we have a specific vaccine against it. And then of course there's the whole debate whether we'd want a specific vaccine against it because if we've got a specific vaccine against the Omicron that means that other immune escape uh, variants could easily evolve inside people that were vaccinated against Omicron. So it's not clear that that is the way to go at all as of yet. Um, the chief scientific officer though of Pfizer is cautiously optimistic that especially in people that have been boosted that we are going to have quite a high level of protection against Omicron. The cases are increasing quite dramatically in South Africa. Nothing like their previous uh, peaks but en enough to cause some increase in hospitalisation because of course the vaccination level in South Africa is low. But the key thing here is this infection is going to spread. If it doesn't make people sick then it's good because it's going to increase herd immunity. If it spreads as rapidly as we believe it's going to and it makes people just as sick as the Delta variant, then we've got problems. It's very unlikely it will make people sicker, but if it did make people sicker, then we've got even more problems, of course. I'm hopeful, as we looked at yesterday, that it's going to spread rapidly and people will be less ill, but we don't know that for sure. But it would surprise me if this virus is really good at spreading and really good at making people sick. So I'm hopeful but we don't know for sure yet, and we're not going to know for some time. I feel that it is the duty of the medical professionals, researchers, scientists, to make their bosses aware that this is, that at least from a mechanism point of view, how severe or not severe this situation may be, so that the reaction can be a little more uh, balanced. I think we are reacting more and I think it is reasonable because we are afraid and scared of the previous events. I think this may not be, again, I may be wrong, but I think it may not be that way. So we should figure out the right approach or try to figure out the right approach. We're really in the corner, seven day, seven day moving average, can you see it is going down? And again, we can, South Africa's about quarter or 28 percent vaccinated so at, on one end there is a lot of noise that they are less vaccinated so they have a higher risk and the doctors within the country are also saying that at the same time there is data as well we have to keep everything in perspective so and again i'm not downplaying the virus i wish it is milder and i wish it can zip through the system and it is mild and we can all get out of this evil situation but we don't know yet what is interesting for me is to see that after all the noise, we it seems to be a fortunate thing that the cases are dropping. Do you see here? So it seems interesting to me. Uh, they have less vaccination, so there is a chance of spreading. And the spread, I think, is occurring in vaccinated and non-vaccinated. And I'll continue to say that at least so far, the information from Dr. Kutsia is that her outpatient patients, both vaccinated and unvaccinated, had milder cases. They were youngsters. They were able to recover at home within a couple of days. I actually read over here, give me one second. It is. It was actually very interesting, a cool bean. If I can just find my mouse. A cool bean had sent this message. <clears throat> which is, uh, it is interesting to see. Doc, so there's a link for Gotang and then cases have risen. So this is from South Africa. Cases have risen over weeks, two times and three times and six times. And Monday on Monday, it's night time, the cases. Might be too soon for the hospital uptake to conclude severity, makes sense. My friends have it now window period of up to seven days from contraction, which is interesting because if a slower incubation period or if a longer incubation period is there, then the virus should end up being milder because it is not causing damage very fast. 
Young infants got fever and high heart rate three days after mom's symptom onset. She is double vaccinated with Pfizer. Main symptoms, headache and some body aches. Day three feels good. Husband double vaccinated with Moderna with no symptoms. Tested today, but will only know tomorrow if positive. So that is the news, which I thought was very interesting as well. Um, I do a lot of work on uh, vaccine induced immunity in general, right? And understanding the interplay between B cells and T cells and stromal cells for developing optimal vaccine induced immunity, right? And so work that I published uh, back in 2015 demonstrated that this population of TFH memory cells um, was the most efficient at coming back into a germinal center um, and kicking off a secondary TFH cell response, which was optimal and needed um, to stimulate memory B cells to differentiate into plasma cells in a secondary response, right? And that rapid re-stimulation is what it's actually protective, not your circulating long-lived plasma cells. You really need to generate newer, more efficient plasma cells from memory B cells. Um, and this is important. I think this is something that's lost in people's understanding of vaccine-induced immunity is that it's not just about your antibody titers at like 90 days after immunization. It's really about your memory B cells. Uh, I'm a memory B cell fan. Um, so that, that fundamental understanding of what is needed for a secondary response, right, which is when you think about protection induced by early childhood immunization, you're looking at what is able to generate a secondary response. Right. So essentially, we don't know a lot about this Omicron virus, but we will know more in about two weeks. And just keep doing what you're doing, essentially. And if you don't have any antibodies after being vaccinated, don't be concerned. It's all about the protection induced by the vaccine to generate a secondary response. And I forgot to mention that some of the new symptoms that are being seen with some of the first cases are itchy throat, cough, headache, muscle pain. And Dr. Campbell had interviewed one of the first cases who was a male and he complained of uh, his bones hurting. Uh, after a couple of days, he said it cleared up, all the symptoms cleared up, but he still had a cough. He was one of the first cases in South Africa to be confirmed as positive for the Omicron variant. Finally, don't wait for the new vaccine that may be specific to the Omicron virus because it may take a while for that to happen, first of all. And secondly, it may not even be necessary. So that's all I have for you today. Stay tuned to Hypertension Resistant to Treatment, where I'll tell you more about what everybody ought to know about hypertension and trending health topics. Thanks for listening and I'll see you in the next one.